the burnout cycle. Have you experienced any of the following? You feel tired, like you can't get a full night's sleep, irritable, like you're pushing away friends, family, people you care about who are normally there for you, that you can't concentrate, you're fatigued, you're not as clear and coherent as you used to be, and you're even losing steam and passion for some of the things that you care about most. Listen, these symptoms are incredibly common that happen to graduate students in their journey. They are the telltale symptoms of burnout, putting you at risk of an ultimate crash and burn. Listen, I don't wanna let this happen to you. The truth is one out of three PhD students do not finish because of burnout. If you take the steps that I'm gonna share with you in this video, they're not only gonna help you avoid a burnout, but they're gonna unleash your productivity to new levels you haven't seen before. I'm Professor David Stuckler. I'm coming to you today from my office at University of Bocconi in Milan, where I've helped hundreds of graduate students just like you to reach their full potential and get to the finish of their PhD. Listen, this is something that happens not to the weak students, not to the procrastinators, but to the action takers, to the most energetic, enthusiastic and ambitious ones. So you're gonna to wanna to take notes in this video and you're gonna to wanna to stick around to the very end because I'm gonna share with you some secret tips you've probably never heard before on how to be the most productive and sustain your energy levels and momentum. Let's dive straight in. First, I wanna tell you a story about two of my best friends when I was doing my PhD at King's College, Cambridge University, at Jeremy and Louie. These two friends of mine, two of the smartest people that I've ever met, and they could not be more different even though they were studying the same thing at doing a doctorate in intellectual history. Jeremy was a bubbly, larger than life character, big, bushy, burly beard, where Louis was a bit more reserved, more introverted, uh, tended to like one-on-one -on -one conversations and spent a little more time to himself. Uh, and we used to always meet after long sessions in the library over the pool table and a pint of Guinness, which was our favorite drink at the time. Uh, now, Louis called himself a grinder. He always said, look, I, you know, the key to success is you've got to power through. You've got to work hard, long hours. Those who make it are, are the ones who persevere. Jeremy, on the other hand, called himself a slacker and said, look, uh, you know, the key to success is efficiency. I don't want to spend all day studying. I don't want to spend all day working. I, I want to do other things in my life. Now, can you guess one of these two did not finish? Can you guess which one of these two it was? As the answer may surprise you. So Louis, Jeremy, and I, we would all go to the library uh, and spend time there. Now, the interesting thing is when I would arrive, Louis was already there. And when I would leave, Louis was still there. Whereas when I got there, Jeremy hadn't even arrived yet. And when I left, Jeremy was long gone. So Louis worked hard. I remember him telling me, I'm going to read everything that was written in the 18th century, uh, which to me seemed like an insurmountable task. But he called himself a grinder and he was going to do it. And things were going well and good for Louis. He was putting in long hours in the library. And I asked him, Louis, uh, hey, can, can you sustain this? Because you're here, you're burning the candle both ends, uh, you know, sun up to sun down. He said, no, 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 gotta, gotta pers persevere, gotta have ferocious tenaciousness. And things were going well for Louis until uh, he got sick, he got the flu, and it knocked him back. And Louis, keen to redouble his efforts, spent even more time in the library. And over time, I could see from the bags in his eyes that uh, Louis was losing his spring in a step. He was losing energy. And as we would talk and spend time together, some of that intellectual clarity that he used to have uh, wasn't there. His, his thoughts weren't as clear. He couldn't articulate himself as well as he used to. And slowly but surely, he stopped showing up for our sessions at the pool table uh, on weekends. He stopped going out and started to pull back away from Jeremy and I, we really missed him. And uh, eventually Louis crashed. Uh, he had a hard crash uh, and had to take time out from his PhD. He got back into it, tried to start again, and went through the same thing, crashed again, and eventually he gave up. Whereas it turns out Jeremy, who was known for often being one of the ones in, in the pub, uh, having a pint with friends, 
uh, and going out, not the one I would have put my money on to finish the PhD, is now a professor at Columbia University, it had a meteoric rise in his career. The reason I tell you this story is because it belies one of the most common fundamental myths about doing a PhD and one that puts you at risk of a burnout cycle. And that myth is that more hours equals more progress. This could not be further from the reality because you know, one of the things that is important to remember and is important to know is that uh, a PhD is like running a marathon. It's important that you get in the habit of thinking of yourself as a mental athlete. And from these marathon runners, there's a lot that we can learn. So one of the things that you'll notice a marathon runner do uh, at the start of every race, well, they don't come out of the gate and a full sprint. You'll notice that the marathon runners, what they'll do is they'll set a pace. They'll set a pace that's sustainable for them. Now, at the very end of the race, sometimes you see them sprinting, uh, and that's well and good because they know how much gas they've got left in the tank. They know that they can race to the finish line because they're not going to crash five meters before that, you know, that banner that they run through. They're not going to crash. Instead. They're going to get to the banner, and then they're going to celebrate and crash just after it. And that's what's important. You've got to know what you can and can't sustain so that you don't get in a cycle of intense activity followed by a crash. And that really is uh, the first point I want to make in the burnout cycle that uh, you'll see in the figure here. Often this burnout cycle starts with a very common pattern. You're feeling good. It's sometimes called a honeymoon phase. You're ready to go. You've got a ton of energy. Just like Louis, you're going to read everything that was written in the 18th century. Super ambitious, super motivated. And you get started and, and it goes well. Uh, it could go well for a few days, a few weeks, even a few months. But eventually, you've set, just like a marathon runner, an unsustainable pace for yourself that it's, you're not going to be able to continue. You ha haven't recognized and set clear limits on what's going to work for the marathon. Now, this is really common because a lot of you, when you start a PhD, you're used to doing assignments. And assignments, tests, exams, you can sprint to the finish line. Um, but a PhD, it just doesn't work. So you got to make sure to set a, a realistic pace. Because the next stage of that burnout cycle, which is what happened to Louis, is fatigue starts setting in. Fatigue, lack of concentration, forgetfulness, uh, the signs of burnout, feeling stressed. And what happens so commonly at this stage is people will realize I'm not producing, I'm not achieving what I want to do. I'm going to start dumping more hours in. And as you dump more hours in and you start to feel more signs of burnout, your progress goes down and you feel more frustrated. And so what do you do? You put more hours in and yet you feel more frustrated and it just perpetuates the burnout cycle until you get to this last stage where you start to withdraw. You start to feel lonely. And ironically, as you start to withdraw and pull away from people, it's right at the time when you most need support. And th this is what Louis went through. Uh, we really missed him on, on the pool table, Jeremy and I both. Uh, he pulled away from people who cared about him. He withdrew, even withdrew from his own project, started to lose interest in the very thing that he was seemed to be the most passionate on earth about. The way to help break elements of this burnout cycle. Set the pace as one. Uh, the other is nourishment. So coming back to the example of marathon runners, you often see runners when they're running a marathon on the side, you have the fans cheering them on and they'll stop and they'll very quickly grab uh, a Gatorade, Powerade, some energy drink with carbohydrates, and maybe a quick snack, a banana or a power bar on the way. They are going to get the right nourishment that they need to keep going, to keep that pace, uh, even an ambitious pace that they've set for themselves. And, you know, look, you're not going to see a marathon runner pull off to the side. Like, yeah, they're not going to be you know, scarfing down a donut and drinking a beer because, yeah, they're getting empty calories, but they're setting themselves up for an energy spike and a crash. That, that's just not going to, it's not the right fuel to put in your tank to keep you going. And so it's really important for you to get the right nourishment and the, the marathon towards the finish line of your PhD. So what does this nourishment look like? Well, it has a few elements. 
And one of them, uh, of course, is support. It helps to have friends that you can count on. In fact, that's what Jeremy and I were doing. Louis was for a while until he dropped off. Um, but it's important to not be in this race alone, to, to have friends, mentors, people you can count on to help you through. You often see in the Tour de France, riders, when they ride together, get in each other's stride, and this can help them uh, maximize their, their pace, especially when they need a little break and they're starting to slow down. Support is social, and social is not just in your field, but it's also important to maintain some relationships outside your field. Other things in terms of nourishment, um, I'm a big fan of the principle that a sound body is a healthy mind. You need to think of being a mental athlete. And, you know, if I could offer you a drug that was going to help you sleep better, feel more energetic, and be more productive, and this drug had no side effects at all, actually prolonging your life, would you take it? I would. Of course you would. And that drug is exercise. So look, I'm not going to tell you, you need to do Hatha yoga and get in touch with your chakras. Sorry if I've massively offended all the yoga people out there. Yoga can be extremely effective. Meditation can be extremely effective. There are many different ways uh, to, to get your mind off work. Exercise is one of them. And to give yourself the nourishment you need, often running, lifting weights, uh, doing a sport, uh, these will release your mind from active concentration on your subject and also give you renewed energy and endorphin heights that are going to make you ultimately more productive. And some of you may think, well, you know, look, I, I, don't, I don't have, I don't really have time for, for this. This isn't, this isn't really the right thing for me, but it, it actually is. This is, you know, have you ever noticed how some of your best ideas come when you're on a walk or when you're in the shower or when you're looking at art or listening to music? And this, some of you think is, oh, I can't take a break now. I've got to power through like Louie. I've got to be a grinder. Well, the truth is that you are t activating the subconscious parts of your mind. You are giving your subconscious room to breathe so that the ideas that are churning in the background and being generated there can, can come to the surface to where you can consciously recognize them. So by getting this right kind of nourishment, you're actually giving your conscious mind a break, but you're activating your subconscious mind giving you the chance to have those bursts of creativity and insight that are gonna help you along the way. But so often that creativity doesn't come when you're grinding away, actively focusing on the task at hand, but when you're taking in that nourishment, uh, often social, it uh, could be physical, uh, it could be spiritual, uh, to keep you moving towards the finish line. The other, strategy to help break the burnout cycle is what I call to hack your psychology is to take advantage of our knowledge of how the mind works to make it easier for you to take the steps you need to take to finish that marathon. And it's what I call a series of small wins. When we look uphill at a big mountain that we've got to climb, it's daunting. And many of us will feel intimidated in not recognize when we put our eyes at the top of the mountain of how far we're coming along. Uh, what you want to do to keep yourself on a positive cycle, set yourself up for success, is to break it into small chunks so that you can get a series of small wins that you can celebrate and be proud of. And I remember with Jeremy having drinks over the pool table, table celebrating a small win when he finished his first chapter, when he finished his literature review, when he published his first paper. And these small wins, they will give you wind in your sails. They're like oxygen, they keep you going. But if you set your target to be, oh, I gotta climb the mountain, that's just not sustainable. And you're setting yourself up for a crash. So this small hack to your psychology, breaking up your project into small, discrete, manageable chunks so that you can attain realistically with the pace you set, small wins along the way, is a really important strategy to, to help you avoid the burnout cycle. I wanna go into the second major myth 
that many students who fall into this trap of a burnout cycle fall into is one that I fell into for a short period of time as well until a, a very smart supervisor I had at Yale helped me snap out of it. And that is the myth that it has to be perfect. Perfect is the enemy of the good. And especially so in graduate school. Listen, the, the truth is no one wins a Nobel Prize as a graduate student. If you do amazing path-breaking work, you're gonna have two problems. One is you're gonna run into the problem that the field is gonna have difficulty accepting it. So you're setting yourself up for a tough road. And even if you do win that battle, it's highly likely it's gonna be falsely attributed, falsely given credit uh, to your supervisor for having generated the original uh, burst of genius and insight that you had. So listen, it's fantastic that if you have some paradigm breaking, paradigm shifting ideas that you wanna run forward with, but the PhD is not the time. The PhD is time for you to complete and set yourself up to get to the next stage of independence, where it may be you're building up your own research team, uh, starting your lab, uh, and, and getting on a tenure track. That's the right time, not now. Now your goal is just to finish the marathon. You can do a next marathon where you get a world record breaking time, but now's not the time. Now, now your goal is to complete and finish well. So when you start slipping into this thinking like, ah, it's just not good enough. It has to be better. It has to be perfect. I have to dot the I's and cross the T's. You know, I don't know if you remember the example from Psychology 101 where you ring a bell and the dog is used to knowing dinner's coming so starts salivating. You know, operant conditioning is a tenet of behavioral psychology. I, I want you, when these thoughts creep in, you think, ah, it's gotta be perfect. It's gotta be perfect. I want you to think of this annoying Disney song from Frozen, let it go. And it works even better because I hate this song. I think I've been around too many kids who play it all the time. It drives me nuts. So perfect, let it go. Perfect, let it go. No, it's, gotta, it's not good enough, let it go. Seriously, those of you who are at risk of falling out into a burnout cycle have a much bigger risk of perfectionism. So I know the song's annoying, but I wanna ingrate it in your head. Perfect, let it go. Perfect, let it go. You need to squash those thoughts so you can keep being productive, keep moving forward to the small wins as you uh, proceed in the marathon race that you're on. Myth number three, multitasking. You know, I could just do so much better if I was better at multitasking. Just, you know, if I could, could manage to do multiple things at the same time, I'd be getting there faster. This is a myth, and this is a very common myth uh, because psychologically we are just not well kitted out to be good at multitasking. I don't want to go give you an evolutionary psychology story about hunters and gatherers and the fruit and berry pickers, but the, 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 the story is that we are much better when we have a laser-like focus on the important task at hand. And so I was never very good at physics, but um, there is a physics analogy that really resonated with me and helped me understand why trying to multitask can be so detrimental to our productivity. And that has to do with friction, a concept that in physics made a lot of sense to me. So as you try to push in one direction, you've got a force that is pushing against you in the other direction. So how does this apply to multitasking? Well, as you slide from one task into the next, you're gonna encounter friction. Say, as you try to shift from working in the lab to shifting to writing a paper, you're gonna have frictional, transitional costs. Those costs will be your time as you phase out of what you're trying to do, get into a new space, get everything set up. As you try to you know, start activating different neural circuits that are gonna be appropriate for writing that you know, might not have been the right circuits for pipetting or doing things in the lab or the space of research you're in. You wanna to try to avoid these unnecessary frictions. I mean, so people say, no, I just gotta get better out of it. How are you gonna get better at fighting friction? It doesn't work. Now, what you can do, sometimes this is gonna be inevitable for you. Um, I would say to try to avoid the most unproductive elements of multitasking that are there. So if you're 
you can do this in a few ways by, for example, if you're going to write, block off in your calendar, good two, three hour period for writing, because that's what you're going to really need to get in the zone, get in the flow and, and get after it. Uh, of course, take the necessary breaks, especially those activating breaks we talked about earlier uh, along the way. And then after you've done your three hour block, at that point, shift into other aspects like the like the lab or if you can ideally set up your whole day to just do different sets of lab experiments so you're staying in the same domain and that way you're encountering a lower degree of friction in your task shifting but it's a big myth that you just have to get better at multitasking your goal is try to try to minimize the most unproductive task shifting and multiple roles that will bog you down, make you feel exhausted, even when you've done very little. And the key to all of this, whether it is on, you know, perfect perfectionism, if it's on multitasking, as on you know, setting your pace and getting the right nourishment is to have healthy boundaries is to have limits for yourself so that you know, when you're veering off track, you know, when you have taken on more than you can chew, because I don't want you to like so many students I've seen to slip into this burnout cycle and follow in the footsteps of Louis, who had so much talent, so bright, so much potential. And just with, had he taken the right steps, had he set healthy boundaries for himself, you know, would have been able to avoid the crash and the cycle of frustration and disappointment he went through. Just like an athlete, I want you to begin to set your boundaries and also monitor your state, monitor your motivation, monitor your energy. Note for yourself if and when you are showing some of these classic telltale signs of burnout so you can nip it in the bud, take action and set the right pace, get yourself the nourishment you need, hack your psychology so you're in a positive cycle, uh, get that frozen song in your head so you're not uh, trying to be perfect all the time and, and set your, your limits, avoiding those unproductive frictions so that you do not make these same mistakes. Thanks for watching everyone. By the way, if you found this helpful, we have actually a coaching program that has helped hundreds of students to be more like Jeremy along the way and avoid that frustration that Louis went through. I've dropped the link uh, below to this video, uh, apply for a one-to-one -one accelerator session with me and learn how we can help you overcome these obstacles to unleash your full productivity on the marathon path to the PhD and beyond. See you in the next video.